As a reminder, if you'd like to join our Bible study that we're going to be doing, I have not put the um, day or time together yet, but uh, when we, once we have everyone, I think I'll leave till the end of this week for whoever wants to come in and join the Bible study, and then we'll figure out a day and time. So does it matter what country you're in? You are more than welcome to join us. Unfortunately, um, it'll only be done in English. But if you're interested, please email me at carrie at drcarriehorn.com, C-A-R-R-I-E at D-R-C-A-R-R-I-E-H-O-R-N.com. We're going to start in Luke 8. After this, Jesus traveled about from one, vill- one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. Let's think about what that means for a minute, given all of the things that God has talked about with regard to the kingdom of God. This is not a physical kingdom. This is a spiritual kingdom. So he's always establishing something in the physical in order to help us to understand the spiritual. Spiritual treasures, for example, who we need to be in order to get into this kingdom, in order to be part of this kingdom. And that once we're in that kingdom and we're given a trust that we're supposed to continue to strive and desire greater gifts and desire greater trusts. We're supposed to desire to be workers in this kingdom and to have children in this kingdom, children whom we have harvested in as workers, and we will wear them all as ornaments. We are also told that this kingdom is like a body in which each of us has a purpose and a function. As a matter of fact, a purpose for which we have been set apart before the creation of the earth. So he has known exactly who and what we would be ahead of time in this kingdom because he's the one who ordained that. We're also told that this kingdom is a temple, comprised of a temple, and each one of us has is a stone in that temple, whether it's a foundation as an apostle or a prophet, obviously with the cornerstone only being Jesus Christ, the plumb line being his witnesses, those who maintain the uprightness of this temple structure, the capstone that twists everything together into its place. Every stone is needed. We might have, some have greater responsibilities and some have lesser responsibilities. We all have a responsibility. And we are told that based on what we have done, the trusts that have been given to us, the responsibilities that we have lived out, the authority that we have lived out, given to us by God, that we will receive our reward based on what we have done. And what we have done, you need to understand, is not a matter of works. It is a matter of the trusts that have been given to us by God because of what we've done in our heart. It is also what is coming out of our right hand, our deeds, our forehead, our thoughts, our mouth, the way that we speak, because that's coming from our heart and the one who is in our heart. So that's where we need to be living. We need to be living in the spirit that is willing and the heart that he's cleaning up where his presence resides. Don't, isn't that the place that we want to be? Isn't that the whole purpose of these pilgrimages that God commanded that three times a year you're to go to the temple because that's where God's presence is? Where do you think you're supposed to go inside of yourself? Well, where he placed his presence and Ezekiel 36, 26 through 27 tells us that he removes our heart of stone, gives us a softened heart of flesh, places his spirit in us, and then he begins to move us. So where's he moving us? He's moving us to follow his laws and be careful to keep his decrees. How? Where? Well, where he placed his spirit. That's where we're supposed to be living, in the heart, in the spirit. And we need to be connected with our spirit. Why? Because our spirit is willing. The flesh fights against the spirit of God. We have to live in our spirit by his spirit. He is spirit. And so he's going to communicate from his spirit to our spirit. And he's going to cause us to have a heart after his heart. But this is something that we have to receive as he's moving us. We have to make the decision that we're going to live in the place that's willing. Because if we make the decision to live in the flesh, then you know exactly what's going to happen. We're going to fight against him. So what is the kingdom of God? What is he proclaiming here? How do you proclaim a building 
or a town or a government, right? How do you proclaim all of that? He's proclaiming this spiritual kingdom and everything that's involved in this spiritual kingdom. The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. Let's just go through each one of these with a little bit of attention. So a farmer went out to sow a seed. We know that that's Christ because he tells us it's the son of man. As he was scattering the seeds, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. So it's immediately just eaten up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. And I always liken this to, you know, the Holy Spirit is spoken of as living water. We have to water those roots or they're going to wither. And how do we water those roots? We water those roots with living water by fanning into the flame of the Holy Spirit. All of these different metaphors are being used. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. What are thorns? So Jesus is about to tell us the meaning of this parable, but I just wanted us to kind of get a an experience and a sense of what's going on here, the various types of believers. And I will tell you that personally, the reason I'm telling you this is because you're going to be in this position too if you're working in the kingdom of God. Because you will be responsible for bringing in the next harvest. You're going to have a role. And the reason you're going to have a role is because you need to understand what's been given to you. You are going to feel the grief of this. You're going to see this right before your face of working with someone who received the joy, excuse me, received the word with joy. And the minute that God required something of them, they gave up. They turn away. They fall but they were receiving it with joy. What happened? It's like a serial dater, right? They like the two weeks of the courting process. And then when there is, when people have to go back to their lives and the relationship is put to the test, they fall off. They become disinterested. Or if there's something required of them, Uh, I changed my mind. This is too much work. As though a relationship is not supposed to be work as though you're not supposed to have any kind of obligation to another person when you're in a relationship, right? So other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. When he said this, he called out, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. His disciples asked him what this parable meant. He said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God I'm going to read that again. The knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. Okay, so again, I say this to you often, that it's important for you to discern who has been given ears to hear. If people can't hear the message, they're nasty and vile. You have to discern that. You can... You know, some of the things that I do is like if someone is being nasty or I'm like, you know, especially because we're writing on posts and stuff like that. So sometimes it's a little bit like you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but you're like, I don't talk like that. So why are they? You can reprove and let them know, hey, I'm willing to have a conversation with you, but it needs to be respectful. And we need, you know, if each of us has the spirit of God, then we need to have a conversation in which both of us are seeking truth. Otherwise, this is not a conversation I'm going to engage in. It's a reasonable response. But you'll see that 
nine times out of 10, if not 9.999 times out of 10, the person who has already been rude is going to come back. You're going to see the spirit. You're going to see that spirit manifest. It's going to rear its ugly head. They're going to snap back and they're going to attack you. For this reason, it is very, very important that you are speaking according to what God has taught you and you are remaining connected to him. Otherwise, you're going to start waffling and wavering. You're going to start going, oh, maybe I said this wrong. Maybe if I had said it this way, they wouldn't have gotten so upset. Maybe blah, 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 you know, on and on. But if you know by what spirit you are speaking, then you're not going to waver like that. You need to stand firm in God's truth and stand firm in what he's doing in you while remaining humble and open to having discussions and also potentially being corrected. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. If you're interested in truth, then you won't mind being corrected and you'll be willing to test everything that you have been saying with what people are bringing to you so long as they're bringing it to you respectfully. Reprove once if they're unrepentant, dust your feet. You have to recognize that not all people have been given eyes to see or ears to hear or a heart to understand. It's God's determination who he's going to give that to. Your job is to discern who has it. And also one thing that's helpful, like I kind of alluded to a little bit earlier, is you can test kind of if you're feeling like that, you re- you're reading someone's message or you're listening to some, you know, you're talking with someone and you feel kind of like that Ugh, in your stomach, in your gut. And the Holy Spirit is like the Holy Spirit's talking to you. He's convicting you, warning you, raising alarms. That's why you need to be attuned to the design he's given you. Then you kind of step back and test the situation. Is that how you would be speaking to someone else in this same situation? Because I don't go to other people who are like talking, you know, they're sharing, they're teaching or whatever and say, nope, here's the truth. Here's what it is. I mean, unless they're just outright wrong, but I'm not really talking to them. I'm talking to others. Because if it's someone like David Jeremiah, that's a different thing. The guy does not care about truth. He obviously does not. If he's been preaching this message, there have been opportunities for him to be corrected and he has just outright decided not to be. So in that situation, I'll talk to other people and let them know this is incorrect and here's why. But to try to to like pretend to open up a conversation with someone by telling them what what truth is instead of, I mean, that's not a conversation. That's just a drive-by. And every single time that someone has done that on the channel, they've been grossly incorrect, not speaking correctly on scripture, but absolutely incapable of being corrected because they're married to a narrative. So anyway, discern who you're dealing with and don't be afraid to test the spirit. The word tells you to test the spirit. How do you test the spirit? By doing exactly what the word says, reprove them, confront them regarding how they're sinning against you. If they're unrepentant, dust your feet. You're going to see the spirit that's in them. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. In other contexts, it's what, what the son of man has sown, right? Those along the path are the ones who, who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, what's the person's responsibility? Because the devil can't take away anything you're holding on to. If you're fanning into that and you are, you know, really wanting to know more and more and you have heard God's voice and you're like, oh, this is the most wonderful thing. Let me, I want to know more about you. And you keep, you know, pursuing him. The devil won't be able to take anything. So these are people who could take it or leave it anyway. Their hearts were already lukewarm. Also, I believe that those, these are those who oftentimes are in churches. In my personal experience, these are those who are in churches who regurgitate the word, who, you know, speak in a particular way, but there is no root. There is absolutely no root in their heart with what they're regurgitating. There's no relationship with it. It is a superficial uh, construct And truly, when God starts requiring something of these people, they're out. They go back to that church that didn't require anything of them. And and they probably justify that it's me. (laughs) It's me telling them to do something that that church, well, that church isn't preaching that. 
Well, what about the word of God? I'm not speaking on my own authority. Those on the rocky ground are the, are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Here you go. The time of testing, when that wooing process, that two-week dating process, courting has ended, they're like, I'm out. He expected too much from me, or she expected too much from me. But obviously, in this situation, we're talking about Christ. And there, as a matter of fact, there's a lot that he expects. I'm not going to, you know, water that down. He expects a lot. I mean, even unto death, that's kind of a lot, okay? But if you believe, and let me tell you something else. If this says they believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away, there is an implicit promise here that there's going to be a time of testing. There also is going to be a time that God talks about, a time of trial and testing that he's going to bring on the entire world at the end of the age. A time of trial and testing. You know what that is? His great wrath. The time of great distress. The time of great tribulation. Great distress as spoken of in Matthew. Great tribulation as spoken of in Revelation. So you should anticipate it. You should expect it. And you should know how you need to stand. And when that great distress, that great tribulation comes in the end, you need to know that you are going to have to stand and you are going to have to put your faith where your mouth is and you're going to have to remind yourself that those days are going to be worse than anything that has ever happened since the beginning of creation. But you are going to have to remind yourself that you have to endure even unto death and that those days will be cut short for the sake of the elect, that you are at the last hour and that your salvation is nigh. Don't give up. And I'm not talking about just for you, don't give up. You keep preaching that word even unto death. You keep encouraging the church. You keep associating with them. You don't go hide in a little corner like a wicked and lazy servant. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. I've seen a couple of these. Those who have been shown that the you know, the discipline, the, the career that they had was not of God, was in opposition to God, He demonstrated, he proved himself to them that he is the one who heals these things, that he is the one who does all of these things, that he's the one in control, that he is sovereign. And then when it came time for them to make that decision, because there is a crossroads that you will hit where God will ask you, what's it going to be? I've shared with you what he's done with me, pulled me out of the career that I had the three businesses that were mine, that belonged to me, that I gave up. It's not even like there's some structure still running over there and, you know, we parted on good terms and, hey, if you ever want to come back. No, I gave everything up. It's gone. But there was a point where it was still there and I was about to give up the last thread. And he did say to me, you've seen what I will do. I have proven myself to you. What's it going to be? Are you going to hold on to this or are you going to trust where I'm taking you? Are you going to trust what I've built you for? And I've seen other people get to that point and go right back to the vomit. It was too much for them. They get choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. They're concerned about what their spouse is going to think, what their family is going to think. How will I ever explain to them? How will they ever understand? Well, you don't control that, but God does. Are you going to trust him? Are you going to put him first? Are you going to love him more than mother, brother, sister, et cetera, et cetera? Are you going to do the things like, for example, what Esther did? If God brings you together with a a husband or a wife, does he not also have the ability when he has brought you together as one flesh in a marriage to turn the heart of that other spouse? How about fasting? Did he not conform all things for good, for the good of of Esther who loved him, for the good of Mordecai who loved him, for the good of the Jews who fasted and prayed and returned to him and repented for their sins and pled with him to make a way for them to be saved from the horrific decree for the annihilation of the Jews by Haman? Will he not do that for us? But it seems that we're unwilling a lot of the time, most of the time, 
people are unwilling when there is something that significant to do that fast, to return to him, to really submit to him and get in deep. We pop back up into our carnality and we convince ourselves that, well, God is saying this, is he? If you think God's saying something to you, test it with the word. Make sure that it stands on the word because you can pop back up in your carnality and you can make up all kinds of things that God is saying. But if it doesn't stand on the word, it doesn't stand. So the seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by life's worries. So these are the thorns, life's worries, riches and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. First of all, they have a noble and good heart. And we know that you can't understand without that. You understand by your heart. You are given a heart to understand. Who hear the word, so they they have ears to hear. They retain it, so they're fanning into flame. God's Holy Spirit, they are reminding themselves as well of who God is, what he's done, the name that he has made for himself, and they believe. And by persevering, produce a crop. So they keep going. They keep enduring till the end, even when the persecution comes, even when family members are dropping off. Those close to them are like, who have you become? You're like a fanatic now. You're a zealot. They persevere through all of that. People saying things like what I tell you, your bones are rotting. You're, you are rotting bones before the nostrils, <laughs> nostrils of Jesus. You're a false prophet. You're a false teacher. You're a blah, blah, blah. I mean, they're going to say all kinds of evil against you. And to be honest, you're going to feel because you know, if you know that God is the one who's speaking through you, you know what he's doing with you and that this message is from him, you're going to know exactly what the word says. And you are going to pity these people because these are those who are coming against those anointed by God. They will be held to high accountability. The best that can happen for them is that they're brought into repentance. So you got to pray for that for them. No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. For there is nothing hidden that will not be disclosed and nothing concealed that will not be known or brought out into the open. Therefore, consider how carefully you listen. Listen to what he just said. Carefully... Consider carefully how you listen. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they think they have, will be taken from them. A lot of people in counterfeit Christianity think they have something. And this is what I was telling you earlier in Luke 7, that when you're working for God, you don't have some sort of, like, you don't ever feel like you have this sort of guarantee, like, oh, I can rest now and, like, not do anything. That's baloney. If you have the Spirit of God in you, you know that you are working out your salvation and that you are not going to have that feeling of fulfillment until you've actually fulfilled the covenant. Anyone who does not have that feeling inside of them is not from God. And I will tell you how I know that because John felt it. Paul felt it. You saw that Paul, after 14 years of doing this, every single day getting the snot kicked out of him, being poured out like a drink offering, after 14 years, he goes to the apostles because he wants to make sure he's not running this race in vain. Do you understand the posture of a man who does that? He does not rest on his laurels. He does not think he's already completed this. He even uses the language, running this race that he wants to get to the finish line fighting the good fight. Those who think that they have completed this race and they're able to just rest and just sit here and wait until God raptures them do not have the spirit of God. They have no understanding. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear. They cannot possibly understand. And the reason they don't understand is why. I told you exactly why. Where do you understand You are given a heart to understand, and God's Spirit makes your heart understand. 
there's absolutely no way that they have the spirit of God in them. If they hold fast to that doctrine and they think there's nothing that they have to do, the spirit of God is not moving them like the spirit of God promises he will do. They are wicked and lazy servants who think that they have already been given something that they do not have. Even what they think they have will be taken from them. Now, what is this light of the world business? No one lights a lamp and hides it in a clay jar or puts it under a bed. In some places, he says a bowl, like they don't put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand so that those who come in can see the light. So let's imagine for a moment what a lamp stand is. It's just simply a stand, kind of like, you know, if you were to have like a, I don't know, like a flat, like a pillar candelabra or something like that, or somewhat of a nightstand. If you look up lampstand in the Bible from the Old Testament to the New, in the Old Testament, you're seeing that the lampstand is being built with a lot of intricacy, and there are specific instructions on how this lampstand is to be built. You are a lampstand. The churches are the lampstand. The bodies of believers are the lampstand, are lampstands. You're being built. You are being built for the purpose for which you were set apart, and you're being built through every experience that God has sent in your life. Yes, God has sent those experiences in your life, not the devil. And so you have to learn from those experiences. And as you learn, your lampstand is being built with a lot of intricacies and specific instructions. It is also being built through the things that Christ talked about in Revelation 2 and 3, where he says, you've done this, this, and this, but you haven't done these things. I'm holding this against you. You've not, your deeds are unfinished in the sight of my God. If you don't get this, if you don't pick this up, if you don't repent and change your ways, your lampstand will be taken from you. Everything that you have done will not be to your credit because it's going to be taken away. You are called to be the light of the world. So his light, when he actually sets his light on your lampstand, now he's testifying to what he's built in you. This is his handiwork. It belongs to you only so long as you are a co-collaborator with God. You have to collaborate with him on building this lampstand. You have to receive his ministry and be changed. It's not easy. I'm not going to tell you that it's easy. I'm not going to tell you that all you have to do is dot, dot, dot. It is a lot. There is a lot that you have to do. Anyone telling you that all you have to do is declare with your mouth and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Paul didn't use that language. He didn't say all you have to do. He wasn't reducing it or minimizing it or making it seem like this is so simple, nor was his example demonstrating that. So that's what it means to be the light of the world. That's what that looks like. You have to be healed by him as an individual. You have to walk in the authority that he has given you. You have to be working out your salvation by fulfilling this covenant. And then he will testify by his light to what he has built in you and what he has you doing. It is a requirement in our covenant. I don't want you to think for one second or be misinformed that this is not a requirement of your covenant, that this is only for, I don't know, prophets and uh, apostles. It's part of your requirement. It's part of your covenant. You have to be activated in the role for which he set you apart. And that requires that you go in order. You are healed first in Christ. You walk in the authority he's given you the house he's set you over, and then you walk in the authority he gives you in his church. Now, Jesus' mother and brothers came to see him, but they were not able to get near him because of the crowd. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to see you. He replied, my mother and brothers are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. Who are his mother and brothers? Are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. You can't just hear it. You have to put it into practice. That is why I share with you my process continually of being broken, of being pulled into him just a little deeper, just a little lower so that you have a trudging buddy. Even though you don't know me, at least you have a trudging buddy. You have one person in this world who's actually doing it, who's actually talking about how difficult it is because I know that in counterfeit Christianity, you're not hearing that this is difficult. You're hearing that this is simple, that this is easy, that all you do is accept what he has done for you and you don't have any responsibility. No, that would be a workspace salvation, right? No. You'll be justified by the faith in your hearts. Faith without works is dead. Therefore, if you have nothing coming out of your right hand, your forehead, your mouth, you have not been brought into your covenant. 
One day Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him saying, master, master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where's your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. While Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. Now, I want to ask you something, because this is something that I had absorbed from counterfeit Christianity previously. When the word is talking about, for example, the they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was fe- feeding on the hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. I have heard false teachers like Isaiah Saldivar claim that demons have begged him not to send them into the abyss, making up entire doctrines about how demons have to have some sort of a host, and that's why Jesus sent them into, into the pigs. These are delusional doctrines that are intended to cause you to study up on and place your focus in evil. Did Jesus tell you to do that? The only thing that has been told of you is to know the schemes of the devil. That's it. You don't need to study up on the devil as though he has some sort of power that you should like be aware of. You should just be aware of his schemes, his manipulations, the tactics that he tries to use in order to tempt you into sin and hand over your power because all of these things have been placed under you. That's what Hebrews tells us. They have been placed under you. You have the choice of whether you're going to give power over to these things. Is the scripture implying that demons need a host in order to live, in order to survive? As though there's some sort of parasite that needs to like feed on your soul or something? No, that's not what's being said here. They were begging Jesus not to send them into the abyss, so he sent them somewhere else. Why? What happens in the abyss? Do you know what happens in the abyss? Have you been told that the smoke of torment rises forever and ever? That they're being tortured in hell? Where does all of this fluff come from? Huh? What do you think? Who is the author of confusion and fluff and lies and deception? Is it a scheme and tactic of the devil to try to get you to idolize him and inflate his fragile, delusional God complex. Yeah. So he establishes all kinds of false doctrines to make you afraid of him. Because when you're afraid of him, you start to think he has more power over you than you have over conquering him, triumphing over him. 
he induces the very shame and fear that he has. So don't let him do it. Don't start falling into these satanic doctrines. There is There are so many so-called pastors and false teachers who have made a lot of money, brag about that money, as I've heard Isaiah Saldivar do, by deceiving you into thinking that God's will is simply for you to just continually go through a revolving door of someone else screaming out spirits for you, again, taking the onus of responsibility off of you and placing it onto an idol to keep you in bondage. There's another pastor you might have heard of named John Ramirez, who claims that he was a high priest in the church of Satan. Who cares? The high priest of nothing. You have no power. Satan has no power. You're just delusional. These are people who've handed themselves over to Satan. They can no more put a curse on you than even command those spirits. Do you understand that those spirits are, on, are at the command of God? Do you understand that Satan has to stand before God in order to get permission to do anything? That when he's given permission, it's because God knows what he's doing in that situation. So where's your power? You have to turn to the one who's sovereign and ask him, how do I endure till, you know, through this? Have you, why have you sent this? Why have you allowed this? Are you dealing with me? Have I sinned? He's going to talk to you if you turn to him. And if you resist the devil, he will flee. There is not one example in scripture where a curse was placed on you by a human being or by Satan. All curses are placed on you by God. All curses are placed on you by God. This is ridiculous doctrine. And the reasons we've ingested it is because we have not loved truth. Plain and simple. God tells us that's the reason we're handed over to delusion because we have not loved truth. And we went and chased after some man's doctrine because we thought the Bible wasn't enough. That's the truth of it, right? That's the bottom line. We have to repent of that. Whatever Satan thinks he's doing and controlling and blah, blah, blah is of no consequence because God is the one who's sovereign. You have to make the decision about who's going to be your God. Who is it that you have placed your trust in? Verse 40. Now, when Jesus had returned, a crowd welcomed him for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house, because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Okay, do you hear that no one could heal her? She went to all, many numbers of physicians, we are told, in, elsewhere in scripture, and no one could heal her. But she came up to him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. If she could just get close enough to Jesus, if you could just get close enough to Jesus. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. Just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now, you know that the reason I'm reading the, the Gospels is because God is moving, ha, has been moving me into understanding and affirming and reminding myself what, the, what Jesus went through, what the apostles went through. He wants me to have these examples because, frankly, I don't have any human examples here on earth right now who are actually doing what I'm doing. And you know what? It's okay because I have perfect examples right here. In the word, I have a perfect example and that needs to be enough. That needs to be good enough. So 
what I have been doing is understanding the heart of God. And, you know, in the last couple of days, I feel him now uh, wanting for me to also look at scripture. And as I'm reading this, to remind myself of who he is and what he has done. So that's what we're going to do right now. We're looking at the miracles. We're looking at what Jesus has done. He has wisdom like no other. No one knows the things that he knows. And he's fulfilling what has been written in the word. He's able to bring a fulfilled understanding to that, to where the people that are standing around who know the Old Testament, which we as Christians need to know the Old Testament, they know the Old Testament and they're hearing him talk about these things and bring fulfillment and uh, fulfilled understanding to them. And they're marveling at him and like in awe at the wisdom and understanding that he has. Then he speaks to them in parable. He speaks to them, not even, he's not just saying, let me give you an analogy. Um, he is speaking to them in parable. And you know, from studying these parables that there are layers and layers of meaning. Jesus is, if he did not, if he was not the son of God, if he did not have the spirit of God, could not have done that. He could not have given so many layers of understanding in a parable so that these are speaking to us continuously. Like you can read the Bible over and over and over. It doesn't matter how many times you read it. You're always going to find something new. God is always going to teach you a deeper layer of what he has spoken. He's able to take concepts and give us different aspects of that concept. And nothing ever has a hole, nothing ever has a gap, nothing ever conflicts in the word. Who else can do that but God? Why is it that some are able to see, hear, and understand, and others are not? For the very reason, he says, this is the reason I speak to them in parable, because seeing they may not, though seeing they may not see, though hearing they may not understand. They have to be given eyes, ears, and a heart by God in order to see, hear, and understand. And by this, you know who has the Spirit of God. By this, you know who does not. Jesus didn't continue to hang out with people who did not have the Spirit of God, who were not children of God. He didn't hang out with them. I mean, the, the Pharisees were always coming around to harass him, but it's not like he was hanging out with the Pharisees. He was teaching others. The Pharisees would show up to where he was at and try to trip him up and they could never succeed. Why is it that Jesus in talking about the parable of the sower is describing the very things that are ha that happened 2000 years later? Same things that I'm telling you, I'm I'm testifying, I see this. I see this happen before my eyes. People who I've worked with, people who I've rejoiced with, people who I've seen God prove himself and cast out spirit a spirit of fear and give them peace and call them in and do incredible things and they fall away. Why is he able to prophesy that? Why, why is he talking about that? Not only for the time, but talking about that for the future. And then of course, these miracles, right? And, the, and also, you know, the wisdom of like my mother, brothers, and those are those who hear God's word and put it into practice. These are things that we hear and then they occur to us and we have understanding about him when God gives us understanding about him. So all of this wisdom and then the miracles that he performs, he's the one who commands the storm. He's the one who rebukes the wind and the waves. And he requires us to have faith. He requires us that when that storm comes, that when the wind starts blowing, that when the waters start raging, that we are going to believe and know that he is God and we will live in that truth and not start freaking out. He's the one who was able to cast out all of these demons from this man who for all intents and purposes would have been described as having a mental, disor a mental health disorder. They've got this poor guy in chains, hand and foot, and he has this superhuman strength, is able to break these chains Jesus drives out the spirit and he is sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed in his right mind. How does that happen, guys? You see this going on. You see what you see people who are living on the street dealing with things like this. What's their condition? Is this a mental health crisis? Is this an unhoused crisis? Or is this a spiritual crisis where there is no solution because people have turned from truth 
to a lie, to the many lies of this world. And yet we call ourselves the light of the world, the salt of the earth. What are we even doing to live into that role? If we haven't received anointing, if we haven't received power, then it means that we have not lived in the faith that we are called to live in, and we need to be pursuing what God requires of us in order to be used by him for the purpose for which he set us apart. That's what I'm praying for right now. I want to help. I want to do everything that he sent me here to do. And look at all the sickening, disgusting, twisted ways that the world thinks that they're helping. Handing out paraphernalia, handing out a safe way to do drugs. Come on. We need to have more housing or do we need to teach? Do we need to help these people to understand what their condition is and free them from bondage? Do we need to fast and pray and become the people that God has already told us we've been set apart to be? Taking the plank out of our own eyes so that we can then teach and help our brother to take the speck out of his. We have a role and responsibility. It's deeply concerning That the things that were happening in the early church, the things that we say, oh, we just have this, you know, because we're entitled to it. Because we wear our crosses and we say Jesus Christ. Therefore, we can scream out spirits. What an incredible lie. What an incredible lie. Where's the faith? He's only precious Jesus to you until he asks something of you that you don't want to do. Sweet, precious Jesus, until he tells you, give up that career. It's not of me. Give up your status and your notoriety in the world. Give up your wealth. Put the last two cents you have into helping God's people. Oh, yeah, never mind. No, that's not coming from Jesus. I hear something else in the delusions of my mind. Are we reading the same Bible as counterfeit Christianity? This is the same Jesus who raised a girl who was dead, who was already being mourned, healed a sick woman who just simply touched his cloak, but she had seen many physicians. And in Matthew, we hear that she saw many physicians only to get worse. I know that story. If you've heard my story, you know I know that story. It's hard, you guys. I understand that it's hard. There's a lot that God is requiring of me and Just when I think I've gotten kind of, okay, I've got my bearings, he's moving me into the next thing. And you know what? He gets to do that. If he redeemed me, if he purchased me with the blood of his son, he gets to do whatever he wants. And only because of his goodness and his mercy and his righteousness do I get any reward for that. And part of my reward in the last couple days has been that he is really igniting me. Like I feel him igniting me and causing me to thirst and to pant and to hunger to have this faith that I've been praying for. And he's bringing me into it to where I'm looking at every single thing that he's done and I'm rending my heart to it. Okay. He did this. He raised someone from the dead. It's important for us to do that. It's important for us to rend our hearts to that, knowing that this is something that he did, not just singing counterfeit Christian lyrics and making that our faith. I've heard people do that. Well, yeah, he's the Jesus that turns graves into gardens. He turns bones into armies. He turns seas into highways. This is just so detestable and superficial. The rock show lyrics. Let's, yes, let's recite the rock show lyrics because we know that better than we do the word. And then we just add our own little story around it, our own fantasy around what this means. The Jesus that's all for us that we, we don't owe him anything. He just chases us around all day, sits in the corner till we're ready to tell him how to be God, and that he's just so excited that we picked him up again. No, that's a different, that's a different God, you know, than the one that's in the Bible, because the one that's in the Bible says, when I called them, they didn't have time for me. They didn't turn to me, so I turned from them. They hid their face from me, so I hid my face from them. No, he's not the God who sits in the corner till you're ready for him. He is a God who requires you to, in all times and in all seasons, be rending your heart to who he is and feasting on his every word and getting up and making this about his day, not your day, his house, not your house, his kingdom, not your kingdom. I really pray that you will take this message to heart and work towards rending your heart to what he wants you to understand about who he is and who he is to you, and how you need to be in order to be in his name. Thank you for listening. God bless you, and I'll see you in the next video.